everyone welcome back to the resilience pod the podcast helping you become resilient in our world full of disruptions you're here with me your host Rina saying thank you for tuning in today now when it comes to writing business continuity plans many of us in the industry falter slightly how many of you have taken plans off google off the shelf do your plans tell you exactly what to do are they generic or are they specific Today, we're going to have a very fun debate with two very distinguished industry guests. They definitely don't need any introductions, but to do them justice, and two guests that I have been following since day one in my career, it is with great excitement to introduce a multi-award winning director, author, celebrity in our industry. And you can see if you're watching, it's got a chandelier in the back. So Charlie McLean Bristol, welcome, and a former journalist, a not so secret blogger, the resilient crisis management director, Jim Preen. Hi. <laughs> How are you both? Doing good today. Very good. Beautiful day today. Looking forward to doing this. Great. Yeah. This, this fun debate we're talking about, as I alluded earlier, generic plans versus playbooks. Charlie, you are team generic plans and Jim, you are playbooks. So let's get straight into it because I know all of us will be wondering why and what this is all about. Charlie, why should you write generic plans? All right, let's take it. Let's take one thing as as taken and I'm sure I'm sure Jim will agree with me on then is we need to have a plan. Of some yeah. sort of description or kind we need to have a plan because um basically because i've got a mortgage to pay and um <laughs> and we need to be keep ourselves in business for for writing plans no i don't think that's the reason to write a plan Charlie, <laughs> frankly. <laughs> you're absolutely right so i think i think we both agree that we need to plans need to be written and i think I've done quite a lot of debriefing from COVID and people say when they've had plans, they find them useful to adapt them to COVID and they gave them a framework for managing the incident. So I think we need a plan. I think what we need to have a think about is a little bit of history. Now, when we look at 20th century incidents, um, on the whole, there was sort of two sorts. There was our natural disasters, which were the hurricanes, the, the, the floods, the, those um, the earthquakes, where we kind of knew the, the incidents were quite compartmentalized. We knew we were in earthquake zone, so we knew we ought to prepare for an earthquake. We knew we ran a, high, ran a refinery, so we need to be ready for a, a processed fire. So we kind of knew where we were at with incidents. And also the incidents were local on the mm. whole. They affected us locally and they didn't affect wide area. If we come onto the, the 21st century, we live in a much more complex, much more interdependent world. And if we look at the, the OVH fire happened the other day, um, I was reading about that and that, that was the big fire in the data center in Strasbourg. It took down um, 3.4 million websites. And the Polish financial ombudsman, if I can pronounce that, the Welsh government um, export hub, the UK government vehicle certification agency lost their website. And, you know, it wasn't a fire, it wasn't in Poland, it wasn't in Wales, it wasn't in England, or it wasn't in the UK. And it was into, and so there was an interdependencies there, which they may or may not even actually known that mm. they had an independent. They put their stuff in the cloud somewhere. It's in the cloud. It's okay. It's in the cloud out there somewhere. And then a fire takes down their takes down their their website. Remember the Fukushima earthquake, which they're busy talking about the clear out at the moment. You couldn't get black cars because the pigment was made of Fukushima. Did Ford follow their supply chain? I don't know. But, you know, these interdependencies of a, a, a tsunami in Japan affects which color car you can buy. Mm. So can we understand all those interdependencies and the complexity of the interdependencies and how they play out? There are new natural disasters if we look at the Icelandic volcano with the unpronounceable name none of us had plans for 
on the close down in airspace. So again, everyone's scrambling around to, to kind of come up with a response to that know it had a response and if we can you know the typical thing is i've done quite a lot of pandemic plan in my various iterations over time and when we did pandemic plan what was it all about it was all about uh it's all about your numbers mm. it was all about we had 10 percent of staff off we had 25 percent staff off you know how do we plan for that how do we keep our business going i remember uh, i'm sure you'll remember if you did pandemic plans there was a security guard sitting there with his um zapper in the morning was going to zap you to go and check whether you're allowed in the office or not there's still arching people around i saw the apple store in glasgow had a man yeah. with the zapper but asymmetric covid you can have it don't look any different to to what we're looking and you can have it so and again there was lots and lots of planning and the 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 incident follow the things that killed us was the close down the close down of whole industry mm. we had no plans plans for it so you know, you can plan for specific events and they never quite play out as you think uh, think about it. You know, tons and tons of people spend lots and lots of money on work area recovery mm. and, you know, whole industry around about it and lots of stuff there. And actually, when the day came, work area recovery was a waste of time because actually some people used it, but on the whole, people got sent home and actually people sorted themselves out with it couple of weeks a month yes of course they madly ran around and it was hard but we as humans are quite innovative and quite inventive and we're quite good at coming up with solutions so again you know that work from home some people had it planned some people didn't have it planned but it all of us have managed to sort that out so my point is to say is do we understand where the next incident can come from? Because of our connectedness, even if we plan it all out and we do, you know, if you look at operational resilience, there's the, they're meant to look at important activities and all that sort of stuff. Yes, you can plan it out, put it all in software, but can you really plan it? Do you really know the impacts, the complexities? Are there instances out there that we don't know about which are mm. going to happen? I'm sure there are, black swans. And does an incident ever play out as we want to do? So to me, if we spend a lot of time and effort going through saying we think it's going to happen like that, are, are we wasting our time? And we're innovative. We can come up with solutions on the day and so that you know that planning please is perhaps the generic plan is all we need so that is the case for the defense yeah it's really insightful there charlie because it's it's almost like an aid memoir and we've all been drilled when we've been learning about business continuity the plan should be a, like a checklist an aid memoir not really specific so really insightful there and i'm going to bring it to jim now who's on the opposing side what do you have against these generic plans because surely they make perfect sense uh, a generic plan to cover event every eventuality okay well let me let me put it this way um and thank you for that charlie um my i want to make the case for playbooks i've nothing mm. against particularly against bc plans big generic plans are fine if you want to have a silo where you hold all that information i'm clearly not against that but let, let me look at this so i want to make the, the case for playbooks the other day i was chatting with an old colleague of mine who's head of bc at marks and sparks and i do a fair bit of work with them and they've had a pretty torrid time of late and i think are pretty glad that they've moved into food and are now not just in fashion in fact they bought a cardo um, just before the pandemic struck and people criticized them for that but i think that looks now like a pretty smart move and the point he made to me the other day is that bc business continuity is doomed if it moves too far away from the core business um, if a business, you know, if it isn't business driven, then I, he thinks it's all over for business continuity. And I think from a businessman's point of view, playbooks make far more sense. They contain all the immediate information that you need, the details that you need for the particular crisis at hand. Are you really in a crisis going to wade through a massive tome that is meant to have a solution for every problem that you face? Let me, let's take an example. A firm has a cyber attack. They're going to need a cyber checklist. They're going to need a kind of handrail to guide them through that issue. 
they're going to need the contact details for the people that they need to contact, both internal and external. The comms team will need a series of boilerplate template statements, which can then be adjusted for the actual event at hand. They're going to need all this stuff immediately. They're not going to want to go through a big BC plan to get there. Um, and Charlie may say that it's tough to figure out what playbooks you need, but I would say that just isn't true. I mean, I can give you three right away. You're going to need a cyber playbook, you're going to need a terror playbook, and you're going to need a denial of access playbook. And then you go away and you look at your business and you figure out what other playbooks you might need and you write those. What's so hard about that? Mm. Mm. Charlie, <laughs> thoughts on that? Right. I, I think I think both of us would agree on, on, on one thing. If I sort of um, pick this a, a little bit closer, I think we would agree on one thing is we don't like we don't like big fat plans because nobody reads them and you know you can waste your life away doing them. Yeah. I think just I think just because it's a generic plan doesn't need to be fat. It can be. Well, it's inevitably going to be, Charlie. It has to be. I mean, if you're going to deal with every problem that um, a company might face, it's going to be large. That's what uh -huh. I like about playbooks is that they're focused. A generic plan by its very nature, it's generic. It's not focused. I, I, I think, yes. I think we're, uh, this is where, in terms, are uh, actually quite interesting there. Because when I talk about a generic plan, what I'm talking about, and that's almost answers our, our second question, mm -hmm. is I'm also asking, I, I'm saying a generic plan for me consists of recognizing the incident, invocation, activating the plan, incident management, how the team, who's in the team and how the team will work, and lastly, communications, and maybe some generic... Lastly, communications. Lastly, oh, no, no, really? no, no, I'm so sorry. With present company accepted, yes. So I, I do a little bit of that's the sequencing of it, communications, but communications, we actually know, uh, I always teach, is, is the, one of the most critical things we'll, we'll do. But, but, but that is within, that is generically the the bit and you'll have a bit of a checklist for these mm. are the sort of things you need to have a think of it's not i i agree totally with you in this bit. it's not the then we have a plan for a fire and a flood and a and a nuclear power station and a, and a bit that i say a generic plan is a framework for managing the incident where which i probably suspect is in your plans as well because you still need to know who's gonna who's on the cyber team to manage it where i see the difficulty with your plans is that um the let, let me let me put this to you let me put this to you charlie let yeah. me put this to you i mean i think you've given yourself away a little bit because you've already talked about writing pandemic plans and what's the difference between a pandemic plan and a pandemic playbook i mean it, you know that's what you're talking about if you write a pandemic plan you're writing a pandemic playbook aren't you yeah i i think that it, when I was talking about pandemic plan to say plans are right in the past, I wouldn't write a pandemic plan these days, mm -hmm. and I would I, I wouldn't have one there. It's interesting. So, yes, I, I think the problem is about the, we just come in very focused on your on your cyber playbook. It's really how much whether cyber is going to play itself out and how much information it is worth do, putting in there because every single cyber instance is different. And can, can, can I explain why? I, can I explain yeah. why I wouldn't agree with that? Mm. And, I, and I think that's a very good point. Can I just very quickly take you through? what a cyber playbook should contain. Yeah. Mm. And I think that might give you an indication why, why, why playbooks work. And th this is j just an example. So I think at the top of a cyber playbook, you're gonna need all the contact details for people that you need to contact with. You know, then we can't, we, we all agree with that. You know, yeah. if you can't get hold of the right people, so you're gonna need contact details details for your staff, for your customers, for your suppliers, for the regulators, for press, all the different people that you need to. And that will be tailored to, you know, to, to, to cyber as well. It's not going to be a complete slew of names. Mm. Thereafter, you're going to need the boilerplate statements for, for the 
uh, for the press office. Um, you know, you don't want them starting with a blank, blank sheet of paper. And the great thing about that is that you can have them signed off by senior management ahead of time. I mean, one organization I work for, um, you know, uses just phrases that you can use in a, in a, in a, in a crisis, I like which I think is quite ha helpful. But so that you have boilerplate statements. So press office is not starting from a blank sheet of paper and those can be adjusted. Thereafter, you need a kind of handrail to guide you through a cyber crisis. And I, I mean, I'm not going to be dictatorial about this. You're going to have to figure this out yourself. But I would suggest there are kind of four stages that you need to work through. You need to assess the current state of the cyber attack. Is it still ongoing? What's the extent of it? And obviously, you try to stop the breach if you can. Obviously, that may be much more easily said than done. But you need to isolate systems that have been compromised and take them down. Mm. And you need to shut down any user accounts that have been used to steal data. Um, of course, you know, as we know from previous attacks like the BA one, it may have been going on for some considerable time and you know, it may be tough to stop. Thereafter, um, you need to assess the damage. Um, you need to, and I, I think one of the first things I was ever taught about crisis management is focus on the impacts. You know, your company's had a cyber attack. What does that mean for you? You know, how did the, then how mm. did the attackers penetrate your systems? How sensitive is the breach data? You know, is it critical? information that you know maybe your customer data has been stolen and people are going to have to take decisions on their own part to to protect themselves so you need to you know you need to figure out if critical information has been leaked then you need to ask was the data encrypted and can it be restored and you need to get the facts straight if you possibly can before you face the public because then you have to notify those who are affected. And if possible, you need to make sure your systems are safe before you do that. Um, you're going to need to inform the regulator, the ICO, in 72 hours um, to do that. I was actually on, a, on an exercise with the ICO, and they are scary, by the way. Um, and they, they, they made the point that, you know, they felt 72 hours was, was at the outer limits of when you should contact them. Yeah. But I guess you might say, well, they would say that. Um, it's also, I think it should feature in your plan that it's tempting to play down breaches. You know, you don't want to make it look so bad. But if you do, and it's discovered later that the breach is really pretty serious, you could have your reputation tattered. And the conundrum here is you go late and you can be accused of a cover-up and you go early and you might ha not have all the facts and you know you could be caught out by a journalist so it's a tough call i'm almost done guys sorry to go on a bit here and then afterwards you know you need a post-crisis analysis you update your playbook and you you know provide an action plan there so i mean i i, I just think I, that that's an incredibly useful and powerful tool a cyber playbook charlie tell me why i'm wrong um <laughs> I think the problem is that, yeah, the, the, I don't think there's anything wrong with that list, but I think the problem is the complexity is more you think. Because people talk about cyber playbooks, and I think sometimes people don't kind of realize some of the complexity within. So, you know, you've got single ransomware, single extortion, lock out all your systems out so you can't get access to your systems. So that's more of a business continuity incident because you can't use any of your systems. Happen to happened to Hackney Council and they're just busy looking at how much it's costing them at the moment. They're still six months still trying to recover. You've got your double extortion where they've ransomwared your, um, they've locked out all your stuff, but actually what they've done beforehand is they exfiltrated your data. And so they're saying, if you don't actually, um, we're going to release your data and release your data. So that's more of a reputational type issue as well as a business continuity issue. And you can have triple extortion where they're going to offer to sell it to your customers. Customers. So you've got that. They put the stuff on the they put the stuff on the dark web, as but happened to SEPA at the moment. So there's three different sorts of it. You might then have a breach, for example, as what happened to TNT quite a long time ago, which is probably less like these days when when they they lost uh, 25 million people on a CD and the CD went missing. And then you've got your mm -hmm. kind of so that's a more that was an accidental stupidity, but there's no hackers involved, but it's still a big data breach. Then you've got your maybe DDoS attack that has taken down your taken down your taken down your 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 service. You can get DDoS attack with extortion. And then we've got credential stuffing, which happened to Deliveroo, where people are selling Deliveroo accounts to get in to, to get into it so you can get free meals. 
So, you know, and, and they got yeah, a lot why, of I, I don't understand why, why this is a problem. We, we, you know, this can all be encapsulated in your play. But I, I must say, Charlie, I'm, I'm slightly confused that you're so against this. Because I, yesterday I was reading an article you published in Continuity Central in 2019. And your article was, what should a cyber incident playbook include? So you're obviously a Christ, you know, um, cyber <laughs> playbooks. So, you know, are you not, you know, my question to you is, have you changed your mind or are you really on my side? <laughs> um slightly caught out by that one but um I, I i think i do a little bit come back to what what i start i am favor a little bit in favor of cyber playbooks because i do think there is some... i mean in so sorry to interrupt Charlie, and i will let you finish yeah. but in that in that article which i thought was pretty good actually and you know you have a checklist for all the ty types of things but you actually thought in that article that there should be a series of playbooks for for the different type of incidents that you've just talked about Yes, and, and I do think that that, that is true. My, my slight worry is it does come out, and, you know, even since that, my, my list of all the different sorts of playbooks you might want to, I'm starting to almost defeat my own, ob defeat it there, because of saying, because of the complexity and the more different sorts of ones, with the... Uh, as you learn more, you're starting to come back to coming back full circle, as we often do in our thoughts, is to say, can you actually, is it getting back to so complex and so many different variations that you do need to have something more generic? You know, because you can write something generic on saying playing ransoms and say, I like to write something, I don't say, you should or you shouldn't. What I like to say in my sort of playbooks and write about that is to say, these are the pros and cons for this or your organization. If you are a senior manager, these are the things you've got to take into account. You might on the day have to make the decision. So I think, I think it is, I, I suppose it's degrees of degrees of of here and once and sometimes we delve into more things the more complex it becomes the more detail you need to do the more you think actually do i need to write something fairly generic because there are so many different variations that it that i come back so i do agree we we we, we do need to write cyber playbooks but quite how they look i kind of a little bit go around the circles on this one and guys, it's really interesting that you both saying this and having this debate, because the commonalities that I'm hearing is that we need generic plans for generic situations and playbooks, specific playbooks for specific things. But they all kind of mean the same to me at this point. And I want to ask you, well, Charlie, first, how many generic plans do we need then? And then the same to you, Jim, like how many specific playbooks do we need? You've mentioned three, but do we need more? And Charlie, you go first with this. I, I think to me, your starter for one is you need one generic plan which is sharp and to the point and really puts over those those things of, you know, how do I recognize an incident? Yeah. What is the invocation? What is the what is the way of recognizing the incident? And how do I decide whether I need to invoke my plan? Who's in the team and how do they work? And then a communications piece about how communications are managed at the different levels. And that is your starter for one, what every, what every plan we need. After that, I agree with the, um, Jim there that we need to, there is some more communications bits which need to be done. Some, um, some, there is more to be, that can be done on communications. Mm. And then I think you have to take a view whether it is worth writing things for different bits. There is things like um, procedure-like plans, where if you think product recall is a process, it's just an emergency right. process. So I agree totally we need to have product recall process because the fact is it's quite complicated. You need to write it down. 
Jim, what about yourself? Your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, d I don't have huge amounts to add on this. I mean, I've, you know, I've been part of writing generic plans in the past. And generally mm. speaking, there's one generic plan. You know, the clue's in the title. It's generic. Yeah. Um, thereafter, you might, well, I've written sort of individual uh, com crisis communication plans as well. But that's not really what I'm talking about mm. here. What I'm trying to sell today is individual playbooks. And I, as I've already said, I think, you know, the cyber one, the terror one, the denial of access... I think one that Charlie just mentioned, a product, you know, if you make things, if it's a product recall, one would be good. And I think basically I would just say that you need to look at your business and you need to identify the particular risks that you might face. And then you write a playbook with regards to that. That's the way I would look at it. Yeah, really, really insightful, uh, both of you. Um, it brings me to my next question then. And something that maybe the listeners and viewers might be thinking is then business continuity plans be BCP is the right word for what we're talking about in this modern day world. So, Charlie, no. what are your thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think uh, they, uh, Jim's got his word in there, but I think I kind of slightly agree with them. I think plans sometimes have a bit of a bad rap and people think it's the folder on the on the roof. Yeah, and I, I do. There is a flavor coming round of people wanting two pages one pages those sort of sides and they you know we live in that sort of world where we want one pages there is no substitute still you know if you send a one page to the regulator then they're not going to kind of accept that there it is uh, regulator there's our plan for the the bank of england or the you know the santander bank or whatever so i i, I think that I think plan, it would be better to come away from the plan. But the thing is about plans, sometimes people know what they are. So if you yeah. call something different, people go, what is that? Yeah. And I guess it's like playbook. Like, what is that? That could mean so many things. So, Jim, you have quite sternly said no. <laughs> I'd love for you to elaborate. That. I don't know about that. I, I, I mean, just... Uh, Sorry, what, what is your question? What, what's your question again? Is BCP the right word? Uh, it's the right no. word. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't love the word particularly, no. um, but I, I mean, it, it has a sort of currency, I suppose. I'm, I'm not particularly against it, but uh, I, I don't have a particular view on that. Yeah, okay. Well, I think we've had some really insightful discussions and ultimately I feel like it's up to us as the individual, the business to decide because I feel like there might not be a one size fits all. So final thoughts, because I feel like we could debate this all day um, and, and get more thoughts in. Jim, what are your final thoughts to help the audience yeah. decide what's best for them? I mean, I think obviously everybody will take their choice, but just if I can just very briefly set out my store for, for playbooks. I think the old generic plans are outdated. They're like two cans and a piece of string, and they're just not <laughs> fit for the modern world. I mean, I'm happy. I'm totally happy if Charlie or anybody else wants to have a whole silo of BC information in one place, and I'm not against that at all. I think that's absolutely fine. But I think in a, in a real crisis, a playbook wins every time and what you need to do if you do have that silo of information then you extract that knowledge from that from that silo that that, that what might be a generic bc plan and then from that you create playbooks I, I think charlie might agree with me on this that it can be tough to get funding from senior management for business continuity at mm. times it's not always easy to get the money right. that you want and if you present a generic bc plan to a senior executive they may not get the value straight away and what is what is this thing mm. but if you produce a series of focus playbooks i'm not going to go through them all again but focus playbooks there you go cyber terror da, da, da. yeah and they're going to get it right away so with that in mind i would say that playbooks are the future and bc plans are the past mm. thank you jim charlie final thoughts for you to have the audience decide what's best <laughs> and I, I suppose I take the de de different view is my definition of a generic plan is a framework which to manage any incident, because I think there's a danger is that if an incident comes along, which we haven't got a playbook for, then what do we do? Where do we start? Mm. What do we do? So we need the generic plan to deal with any incident. I think there is a, a sliding scale of 
this end very generic for any incident, this end very specific for a particular type of incident, and there is a sliding scale in that. I'm more inclined to put my sliding scale up towards this end and saying, because of the complexity of the world, because of we don't know what is going to come up next, and even our risk assessment and all the fancy things with horizon scanning, things come out of the blue, that we're better to do more generic than more focused, because the, the more focus we get, the more unlikely it is either we have the right incident or the incident plays out as we thought. So that's why I say put your plans up towards the more generic end rather than the more specific end. Thank you, Charlie. That is some really interesting food for thought. And guys, if you're watching or listening, what have you decided? Let us know. Get involved in the conversations, comment below or connect with us on LinkedIn and let me know what you think. You know, uh, I feel like maybe we need a bit of both uh, just from the debate, but ultimately it's up to you to, to decide what is best for your organization so thank you Jim and Charlie for coming on the resilience pod and get taking part in this friendly debate <laughs> 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 you have definitely given us a lot to think about and I think it's really important that we do consider these options so thanks once again and guys thank you for tuning in today you have taken the step to become resilient so do let me know what you think and connect with us if you've liked what you've seen then don't forget to subscribe to the resiliencepod.com site join me on Instagram and LinkedIn you can search for it and until next time this is me your host Rena Singh with Charlie and Jim saying goodbye keep on investing in your resilience